If growing up 10 miles south of Trek headquarters has taught me anything, it's that cyclists are the worst. My bike dreams began as a mechanic in 1990 when I was 13 years old. And those dreams were crushed just two years later when the local shop closed because they could no longer keep up with the minimum order requirements to be a Trek dealer. Now convinced that I could never make a living with a bike shop in my hometown where any hooplehead can become a cyclist by tapping their neighbor's friends and family discount for a top of the line Trek bike of their own to hang in their garage. I honed my skills at a bike shop in college where I learned how to drink my way through two decades of real jobs and I took up golf. Naturally, this life resulted in a soul-sucking existential professional crisis, and as I emerged from the void, I found myself back wrenching at that same bench from college, wondering why I was only getting paid 20 bucks to make some other guy 100. How do I make a living with a bicycle business while avoiding the cyclists? Let's follow the logic. If cyclists are bad, then who's good? That's right, regular people. And what do regular people need that cyclists will never want? That's right, regular bikes. And where do people go to get regular bikes? That's right, nowhere. So that's when I set out to open the first anti-cycling store bike shop. And I've enjoyed seven successful seasons of tuning and reselling the same friends and family Trek bikes from days of old to scores of regular folks that just want a decent bike to ride without having to become one of the cyclists. The important thing here is we get to the part where you ask me, what's so bad about cyclists anyway? Well, funny you should ask. Allow me to alienate a very profitable customer base for a fleeting 15 minutes of fame. The roadies. Ah, the low-hanging fruit. These are my people. Nothing screams middle-class mediocrity like skin-tight lycra plastered in high-vis corporate logos, clamoring for calories in a quick-trip juice case, clickety-clacking their way into the neighboring urinal, digging for one inch of dick behind two inches of diaper because they're athletes. No, champions in the making. Listen, Lance, you're boring. Your bike sucks, and the TPS report is due first thing Monday morning. Don't you have a lawn to mow or something? The mountain bikers. I gotta admit, now that they're starting to pave the trails, it's all starting to make more sense to me. Till those Walton boys doubled down on Grandpa's wet dream to destroy small town America and turn Hickville, Arkansas into a mecca for dirt worshipping flat brimmers, I thought mountain biking was the grossest act of white privilege I've never enjoyed. Thankfully, the Walton Foundation's DEI director signed off on a $75 million investment into creating 165 miles of urban single track for rural America so you have a convenient place to ride your $4,000 full squish man toy. But don't expect stew and T-dubs, no, that's really what they call each other, to have a Tacoma bed full of IPAs for you at the trailhead, bro. They're way too busy investing in flying cars these days. The Gravel Grinders. When the paved bike paths, protected lanes, manicured single track, and rail to trail systems have gotten too easy, you gotta get creative and be willing to go the distance if you're gonna prove that you're a truly exceptional cyclist. So build out your makeshift camper van cause you gotta drive thousands of miles just to start this ride. Welcome to nowhere land where no one ever goes because there's no good reason to be here. It's hilly, it's windy, it's hot, it's dusty, and the roads are impassable by anything but the hardiest of farm equipment. With no chance of shade and 75 miles between services, you're not even expecting to finish what you've started. All you have to do is sign up to do the Grav Grav 250 and post pics of your gravel rig to earn hundreds of heart-shaped participation medals. Hopefully it rains for three days and makes it all impossibly muddy. Wouldn't that be great? The racers. If there's any type of cycling that had potential to be great, but devolved bicycle usage to its lowest possible form, it's the traditional European underbiking tomfoolery now known as cyclocross. Let's take a traditional road racing bicycle, but make it way more practical with wider knobby tires, lower gearing, and cantilever brakes for more mud clearance. So we can take shortcuts off-road all year round. Oh my God, the perfect bike, I'm in. Last one to the steeple in Waterloo is a rotten egg. No! 
Fast forward 125 years, and suckers waiting all summer long to the weather to finally suck, to set out to ruin a perfectly good county park. Doing laps on short courses, taped off with manufactured obstacles and off-camber turns, forcing them off their bikes, to run up muddy inclines and through frozen creeks, while revelers dressed as hot dogs throw beer on each other. Oh, not tonight, honey. I'm busy practicing dismounts and gluing tubulars so I can finish 34th as a Cat 3 master at CX Nats in four months. The Advocates. Probably vegan, these urbanites look for opportunities to stop traffic as a pedestrian and take the lane like a bread truck as they pull out of the co-op parking lot using their homeschool kiddos as human shields on a cargo bike loaded down with gluten-free organic chia seeds. They're teaching us all a good lesson as they work their way over to the Dharma Center for their afternoon Reiki treatment, while their partner brings home the facon as an environmental justice liaison for the State Transportation Authority. You don't like it? Build new infrastructure. Copenhagen banned cars and it's a f***ing utopia. Hand over your keys. These streets belong to the people now, goddammit. The curmudgeons. Also known as retro grouches, these guys with their steel bikes, triple chain rings, wire baskets and friction shifting, wear wool underwear just to keep things itchy enough so in comparison, their obsolete bike tech can provide the luxury and superiority they say it does. I'm looking at you, King Grant, Lord of the Unracers. Your $150 Sun Tour Power Ratchet knockoffs may deliver the haptics of your youth, and they certainly get the job done the simplest way possible. But for 15 bucks, the Hoopleheads shopping at Gibbs can click, click, click their way up the only hill in town and not worry about the nose of their saddle cramming their tidy whities up their crack from a ghost shift under load. I will likely buy your reverse pull rear derailleur when it's ready, but not before I convince my frame builder to rebuild my 650B rim brake bike around Jan Heine's $900 Nivex contraption so I can experience firsthand the superior cycling technology of 1930s France on my $12,000 Randonneus. I mean, they're not all the worst. Lucky for you, despite the efforts of all the insufferable cyclists out there, I've somehow managed to come up with three perfectly acceptable ways to use a bicycle. Here they are in order of appearance in my life. One, just riding around. Riding a bike just because it's fun and feels good, or maybe it's the best option. This can be done by anyone, anywhere, anytime, on just about any bike. Riding your bike to the store and back, or maybe around the lake or something, is almost never a bad idea. Now using a bike to get to work and back? Eh, it's debatable. I still don't know why you'd ruin a perfectly good bike ride by going to work in the middle of it. Cyclo touring. Now if you've never taken a long bike ride for recreation, it's going to be really hard to understand the true value of this word. Walking is just too slow to cover enough ground to truly get away from it all. And you're very likely to miss all of the good stuff along the way from inside the confines of your motor vehicle. Traveling by bicycle puts you right in between and it's where all the magic happens. And number three, Adventure cycling. Basically, it's just next level cyclo touring, but it's less about travel and more about discovery. Of course, to be open to adventure and discovery, you'll have to dabble as a roadie, a mountain biker, a gravel grinder, a racer, an advocate, and you might end up being a curmudgeon. Using a bicycle as a tool for adventure got us riding out the storms on the lost highways, carrying more cargo deeper into the mountains, learning new culture, and making new friends along the way. From where I sit, this is what drives meaningful bicycle innovations, not racing. Which brings us back to Trek. Now to be fair, I only pick on Trek because of proximity, and Lance. I actually admire the Trek origin story, and they've inspired my passion for bicycles immeasurably. Trek has only been alive a few months longer than I have, and I've never lived more than 20 miles from corporate headquarters. I grew up alongside Trek. From wide-eyed children filled with the innocence of play and bewilderment to becoming full-grown, boring-ass adults most concerned with advancing our careers and saving for retirement. Well, at least one of us anyway. The mission was noble. In 1976, John Burke Sr. and Bevel Hogg set out to produce mid-tier performance bicycles that got the job done for regular people as an alternative to the unobtainably fancy and expensive bikes only available from Europe. While Bevel seemed drawn to the racier side of things and chose the name Kestrel, according to Trek's own website, JB Sr. chose the name Trek because it called forth images of travel and adventure, something that held the promise of longevity and freedom and exploration and quality. It goes on to claim, Trek was never just a name. From the beginning, it was a summation of values. Huzzah! 
That's a summation of the same values I hold. But today it takes a little bit to find the bike packing and touring section of the Trek catalog online. And when you do, those bikes start around $1,800, which adjusting for inflation buys you about two of the entry level Trek road bikes from the early days. The next section of the Trek heritage page clearly ends with, racing is what we've always done. I think Bevel Hogg wrote that right before he jumped ship. Okay, fine. Maybe I'm a stuck-up, grouchy, curmudgeon bike snob. Or maybe I'm just a helplessly passionate, lifelong bicycle mechanic who's watched everybody win in spite of me. But regardless, I'm a mechanic first, a cyclist second, and a shop owner third. I'm representing the bikes here. I really don't think they like the carbon fiber and the internal cable routings and the press fit bottom brackets, integrated headsets and the electronic shifting or any other proprietary garbage designed to wear out or become obsolete. So cyclists have to seek out the next best thing to buy to secure the bottom line. Modern bicycles are produced by engineering and marketing firms selling products into the cycling market. It's a manufactured market and given the current state of things, I'm not sure it's sustainable. I hope I'm wrong but not really. Hey, thanks for watching to the end. If you like this video and want to see more, you know you got to support the channel by clicking all the buttons, especially that notification bell, so you and your bike can stay tuned.